Hello everyone and welcome back to a continuation of the video series talking about the introduction to the finite element method. And today we are going to be starting chapter 3 in the book called A First Course in the Finite Element Method by Daryl L. Logan. And this chapter talks about the development of truss equations. In today's video we are going to derive the truss equations, understand different aspects of the displacement function and basically have an example to try to check this out. Of course the other topics mentioned here, the transformation matrix, definition in 2D space and 3D space and so on, is going to be covered in next and future videos. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. All right, so um, today we are going to basically go through all the steps necessary for talk for, for deriving stiffness matrices. This, of course, is a little shout out to our dear subscriber, Donald Hanier, who basically mentioned that he did not see in the spring elements step two and step three, among others. So today we're going to take a look on all of them. Please notice that um, I'm assuming that you are watching the video series from the start. If you have not done so, please double check the playlist I will be linking on the top right because there is a lot of similarities between the spring element at least and the truss element. As a matter of fact, a truss element is almost like a spring element with more complexity to it. So today you might only expand a little bit on the spring elements, but of course next video after it will be when we have two dimensional elements. But for now it's one dimensional. Step number one, is well selecting my element and I have my element selected. It is a bar element or a truss element, an axial force element and for this element I have well applied forces on both sides. In this case I'm applying tension forces on both sides. This element is connected between node number one and node number two. The characteristics of this element is well usually it has a length L, it has also a cross-sectional area A and an elastic modulus E. In the finite element method considerations, you have a local axis x, which is going from the left to the right, which means you have a degree of freedom. Furthermore, you have at node number one, a degree of freedom u1, because it can move in the horizontal direction, and a force with that degree of freedom f1x. At node number two, you have u2 and f2x. One of you could think, wait a minute, why aren't we considering one to be moving up and down? Well, for two things. First of all, we will consider that in the next video. Second of all, the movement up and down for one and two do not create anything with regard to forces to this element. The movement that creates forces in this element is an expansion and contraction of the bar. Now, I can see where you're going with this. I can predict your question. You would think, wait a minute, CE. What happens if I move one part up and leave the second part as is. Doesn't, I mean here I have like a movement in Y. Doesn't this mean that suddenly I have a change in length which will cause a force in my element? Well the answer is yes, my dear hypothetical viewer, and we will be talking about this when we talk about 2D and transformation matrices. My defense right now is that you have moved the point in Y but I can still consider the local axis X aligned with the element. And what you really did is you have increased the length of the element by delta X in the direction of the local X axis. And that's why it's very important to understand local axis X versus global axis X. Something that we'll be talking about in the next video. But still, I know some of you would ask this question. So uh, I wanted to mention this question just while I'm video uh, recording that thing. Our element is a bar element. What do I know now? Well, of course, I'm assuming that you have basic knowledge in civil engineering. We have the stress uh, equations from Hooke's law. This is mechanics of materials in which I have sigma equals E multiplied by epsilon, where E is the Young's or elastic modulus, and epsilon is the strain. We are in the linear domain. This is a linear static analysis. What about strain? Well, strain is the change in length over the original length. From mechanics of material, I know that due to equilibrium, the tension forces are going to equal the area multiplied by the stresses. And by the way, this is always correct, so it's a constant. With that being said, I can derive a differential equation. As a matter of fact, all elements in my structures are governed by differential equations. And the differential equation I have is this one. Now, how do I get that? Look, A multiplied by sigma equals t, which is a constant. Now let's start plugging in stuff. 
So if you start plugging in some stuff, you would get A uh, multiplied by sigma, which is elastic modulus multiplied by strain equals the constant T. Now you know that the strain is delta U or DU over DX, which means you can replace your epsilon with DU over DX. All of that equals T. T is a constant, which means that you can further derive it into a differential equation. If you take the derivative of both sides, this will be d over dx, and this will be 0. And this is your governing uh, differential equation for a bar element. Now, of course, you can solve this differential equation, but then, of course, we are talking about the analytical solution, something we are not interested in, in the finite element method. As a matter of fact, this problem is not that hard, so you could double integrate or whatever to find the analytical solution of a bar by hand. But, of course, we are not talking about the analytical solution, so... I will leave this for you. We're talking about the approximate numerical solution using the finite element method. I want to remind you that the finite element method is just a method of solving differential equations, nothing fancy. We have multiple assumptions here. The first assumption is that A and D are constant, and that's perfectly fine because usually our area and our elastic modulus is a constant. Of course, the question is what happens if it's not constant? Well, if it's not constant, then A is a function in X and E is a function in X. Those needs to be taken into consideration. However, even if, assume that your area is not constant, of course, your elastic modulus should be constant, but even if your area is not constant, you have two options to tackle this. The higher level MSC PhD level is to go deep into A and E and rederive your equations, taking into account that A and E are, well, variables along X. The BSC way and the usual practical way uh, of solving it is to basically not take this as one full bar but discretize this into multiple bars and each bar has an area that is assumed constant if you have this bar you have an area in the beginning and an area in the end and you could discretize your element into pieces and each piece gets an area assumed to be constant which is the average of the starting and ending area that's a little cool trick you can use to simplify your problem i would use that when i you are dealing with practical issues anyway it's a truss element it's an axial element so the only thing you thing you see is forces in local x forces in y as well as moments are zero nothing exists here the transversal displacement is ignored what i mean by this the transversal displacement is ignored in the local system because there is no transversal movement in the local system. If something happens in the local system that rotates the bar, well, it's called local because it will rotate with the bar, so there is no displacement. The idea of loads being applied on nodes, well, this is a basic truss um, assumption where there is no transversal loads in the center of an element because it would create shear and moments. With loads on nodes, your elements are always two force members. But doctor, wait a minute. Uh, I will ask what's the point. He would tell me, wait, doesn't it have a self-weight W? And the self-weight W, by definition, is applied in the center of gravity of the element. Doesn't this mean that I have loads not on the node? And the answer is, yes, I do. But we don't deal with it like this. We actually cross W and apply half of W on one node and half of W on the other node. And that is basically one a big approximation. This is what softwares like Autodesk do, Autodesk Robot do, when you deal with truss elements. So I hope that I was able to try to so, uh, answer all the questions you have. What about displacement functions? We are going to assume a constant strain in the bar. Strain is the derivative of the displacement. If you assume the derivative to be constant, when you try to find the displacement and integrate this derivative, which means you are going to integrate the constant, you will get a1 plus a2x. What is a2? a2 is your constant. What is A1? A1 is the constant of the integration. So basically, if you assume the slope to be constant, this will give you a linear function. And our displacement function in this case is linear. More to that later in, the, in, the, in this video when we talk about the displacement function. Now, with that being said, let's continue. Remember, we are at step two, so step three should be stress strain and so on. Our mission objective is to try to find the relationship between the forces locally at the nodes with the displacements locally at the nodes. Now this could look like this in a spring element and maybe it looks like this in an axial element. Spoiler, it does. But why? Well, let's take a look. Talking about the strain displacement and stress strain relationships, this is simple mechanics of materials. Strain is the change in length over the original length. Now the change in length as the similar 
as similar to a spring in this case, is u2, which tries to increase the length, minus u1, which tries to shorten the length. So basically, it's u2 minus u1. This is your delta, your change, divided by the original length, which will give you a strain. Notice, this is an engineering strain. There is a more accurate strain where you have an integration, and the more accurate strain is, well, the differential equation, du over dx. But we're dealing with engineering strain now. Of course, the stress-strain relationship is Hooke's law, nothing to be added. Let's derive the element stiffness matrix. Now, how would I do that? Well, remember, our mission is to find forces relationship with displacements. So what do I know? Well, I know from mechanics of materials that force equals sigma stress multiplied by area, A. Now, what is my sigma? Sigma equals E multiplied by strain. And what is my strain? Strain is, well, U2 minus U1 divided by L. So if I add all those things together, I will get the tensile force of the bar. I'm saying T because I want to I assume tensile here. It will be somewhat corresponding to what I've written here as statics. Notice that those arrows are the statics forces, whereas F2X and F1X are the finite element method forces. My tension here, T, is going to equal, well, E multiplied by U2 minus u1 over l multiplied by a. This is basically the force when, when I plug everything into that thing. Or you know this from mechanics of material, another way of, another way of getting to this is to remember your mechanics of material where it says delta equals pl over ae, your delta being u1 minus u, u2 minus u1, and your p being your t. You can get the same equation like this. It doesn't matter, I just want to explain it. My t here equals ea over l multiplied by u2 minus u1. And we're getting closer to our objective. Our objective is to connect the forces at the edges of an element to the movements at the edges of an element. Now, I got the movement part right, but I still need the force part. But the force part is actually really easy. Look, the idea in all my derivations is to assume positive forces according to statics and positive forces according to finite element, and then try to find the relationship between them. In this case, F1x equals negative t, which means it equals Ea over L multiplied by U1 minus Ea over L multiplied by U2, because the negative flips your U1 and U2. What about F2x? Well, F2x in this case actually equals positive t, which means that you have an Ea u2, or if you want to sort it, negative ea u1 over l, if you want to sort them, plus ea over l u2. And you can immediately see the factors. You can see that this is a factor, this is a factor, and this, and this. So it would not be surprising if I end up having a matrix with ea over l, negative ea over l, negative EA over L, and EA over L. So this is what I'm expecting now. Let's take a look if I'm right or wrong. It's exactly as I expected, but the teaching assistant was actually a little bit noobish. He should have uh, flipped those so that he can have U1 below each other. And, well, lo and behold, yes, it's, uh, it's actually much neater here. EA over L is taken as a common factor, which leaves you with 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. This is eerily similar to what you had in a spring. As a matter of fact, a spring element and a bar element are almost the same, with the K of the bar being AE over L. So it's a kind way of understanding the intricacies of springs and bars. And that's the reason why we started with springs, to get an idea of that. So, okay, I have my stiffness matrix, which is, well, AE over L. Positive, negative, negative, positive. And that is my stiffness matrix. And this, once again, is going to be sorted in a little library I have for stiffness matrices. Because remember, I told you in the end of this course, so you're going to have a library with stiffness matrices inside. And if I tell you, for example, beam, then you know immediately what stiffness matrix to use for the beam element and so on. So now we have a stiffness matrix for the truss element. All right, so with that being said, we need to assemble our stiffness matrix, something I've explained before. And we need to solve it, post-process it. This is very similar to the spring videos, which I will link above spring 1 and spring 2. It will be linked on top right. Let's go to an example to understand that. Now, of course, notice in this example, once again, I am shying away. I am not shying away, actually. I'm just postponing the complications for next time. But I'm shying away, between quotation marks, 
of dealing with any complicated structures because I want my local x and my global x to coincide because I don't want to talk about the transformation matrix today. Also notice my teaching assistant messed up and he actually print screened it while there was a cursor moving. So good job. So we have three truss elements now and well everything is given here and here you have the elastic modulus, the areas and so on. There's an area for elements number one and two, so element one and two has different areas. What does he want from me? He wants the movement at one and he wants the displacement at node number two and three as well as the forces in node number one and four. Those are your actions. Of course, you could dive deep into it and find the local forces this time, similar to what I have done to a big spring uh, example last time. But I will, ref I will refrain from that because there is more interesting other examples where I want to dive deep. So how do we do that? You will notice now that everything is repeating from the spring video. And it might be a bit boring today, but I promise you next time you will have some cool stuff. Well, let's try to find the stiffness matrices of all elements. Now, what is the stiffness matrix? Remember, the stiffness matrix is Ea over L multiplied by 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. That's my stiffness matrix, K equals. Now, for element number 1, it connects node number 1 with node number 2. And, well, it's A, this is the area, multiplied by the elastic modulus E, divided by the length 30 and the ones here. So this is my stiffness matrix K1. It's small k because we are talking about the local axis with one as a superscript because it's element number one. Of course, we realize immediately that K small and K capital are one and the same because the local axis of the element and the global axis of the problem actually coincide. This is of course not always the case, but a simplification for this case nonetheless. We go on and go to element number two. Well, let's try to do it ourselves. So element superscript number two equals Ea over L. Now the E and A of element number two are the same as the E and A of element number one. So you would have an area of one multiplied by 30, I think PSI it was, I forgot the unit, divided by the length 30, and one minus one minus one, one. Lo and behold, it's exactly uh, the same here. It's the same numerically, but physically it's different because element number two connects two with three and not one with two. Uh, so you can see the answer here. For three to four, well, this was just a little trick the problem played for you. It just multiplied the area by two and divided the elastic modulus by two, so you still get the same number. That's just a small example. In real life, you might have different things to consider. With that being said, it's time now to assemble our global stiffness matrix. Now there was a step that should be, have been done before assembling the global stiffness matrix because the global stiffness matrix is a K capital and you have the local stiffness matrix is K small. So one step that should have taken place is to take K small and convert it into the global system. This was not done because once again I want to remind you the local system and the global system coincide so there is no transformation. With that being said, let's start filling it. You know what? I'll try fill it myself. Let me just right click here. And well, first of all, you can see all of those stiffness matrices have 10 power 6 here. So I will take 10 power 6 as common factor. So here is your 10 power 6. And let's multiply this by whatever is inside. I have 4 degrees of freedom. 1, 2, 3, and 4. So my matrix is 4 by 4. This is degree of freedom 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that's one, two, three, and four. So let's take one with one. One with one is 10 power six because this here is one, two, one. I'm numbering the degrees of freedom because element one connects one with two. This means that the first column is one, the second column is two, the first row is one, the second column is two. Element number two connects two with three, which means that the first column is two and the second column is three, as well as the first row is two. This the second row is 3. Element number 3 connects 3 with 4, which means that the first column is 3, the second column is 4, the first row is 3, the second row is 4. Now I want 1 with 1. 1 with 1 is 10 power 6. I've taken it as a common factor, so I only have a 1 here because I've taken 10 power 6 as a common factor. What else do I have? 1 with 1. Nobody has 1 with 1, so okay. Then we go to uh, 2 with 1. 2 with 1 exists only here and it's negative 10 power 6. If you take 10 power 6 as common factor, I can write here negative 1. 
Uh, three with one doesn't exist because look, this is node number one, this is node number three, there is no connection between them and that's why there is a zero. Also check all the elements, there is no connection between one and three. Similarly, one and four. We go to two with two. But doctor, what about two with one? It doesn't matter because it's symmetric. I will fill it later. What about two with two? Two with two exists in element number one and also exists in element number two because they are all connected to join two. You can see 10 power 6 and 10 power 6, so 2 multiplied by 10 power 6. If you take 10 power 6 as a common factor, you get a 2. We continue here with 3 with 2. 3 with 2 exists, it exists here, so actually it's negative 1 because common factor. And finally you have 4 with 2. Now 4 with 2, if you look at the drawing, 4 and 2 do not have any connection between them, so it should be 0 and it is 0. Okay, so going on with this now, we need to go to 3 with 3. Well, where is 3 with 3? You can see that element number 2 connects 3 with 3, and element number 3 connects 3 with 3, which means 10 power 6, 10 power 6. You have two 10 power 6s, which means you have 2 here. Now, it's not always going to be that simple because this example is so simple that it has all the same numbers. In real life, we don't have the same numbers. 4 with 3, like column 4, row 3. Column 4 of row 3 exists only here, and you have a negative 1. Finally, 4 with 4. 4 with 4 only exists here, so you have a 1, and that's it. What about the rest? Well, you just mirror it, because symmetry. 0, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 1. That's your stiffness matrix for you. So that's how you would assemble your global stiffness matrix, slow playing it. Do an instant replay right now. So instant replay, you can see the circles being applied on the position that is relevant to the stiffness matrix. So your instant replay, you can see those elements being filled in the stiffness matrix. Personally, I kind of like showing you this step by step because it just further um, cements the idea of how to assemble the stiffness matrix. So let's continue similar to the spring. Let's continue solving. Now, the F capital, and this is the global forces, multiplied by the K capital, which is the global stiffness matrix, Sorry, the global forces equals the global stiffness matrix multiplied by the global displacements. The global and local are one and the same because until now, local and global coordinate systems were coinciding. Anyway, that's your stiffness matrix. Now, you cannot solve that yet because you have no boundary conditions, so you need to apply boundary conditions. How do I apply boundary conditions? Well, take a look. One is fixed to the wall, so it cannot move, so that one is zero. And four is fixed to the wall, it cannot move, so that one is zero, which means I can eliminate... As you will see right now, I can eliminate the first and the fourth row and column and solve a two by two system of equations. I mean, look, what are the things I know and what are the things I don't know? Well, I know what u1x is, it's zero. I know I don't know what u2x is because I'm trying to find the deflection of that thing. I don't know what u3x is because I try to find the deflection of that thing. I know what u4x is because it is zero. Similarly, I don't know what F1x is because it's the reaction. I don't know what F4x is because it's the reaction, but I know what F2x and F3x. You can see that there is always a dynamic where if you know what U is, you're trying to find the F at that case. And if you know what F is, you try to find the U at that point. So this is exactly the strange dynamics I have every time. So with that being said, I can eliminate those equations and get to my simplified system of equations that you can easily solve. And after you solve that easily with a computer or a calculator, you get U1, sorry, U2 and U3. Both are positive, which kind, which kind of makes sense because I'm hitting it with a 3,000 pound force. So I'm expecting 2 to move and 3 to move. Notice something very cool. Uh, 2 is moving more than 3. As you can see, 2 is moving more than 3. Because, I mean, look, the force is being directly applied at point 2 and a little bit far away from point three, so it makes sense that the point of application of the force is the one that moves the most, whereas the other points that are far away feel less of a force impact because it needs to travel the entire movement and the entire element until it reaches it. With that being said, you can find the reactions. How do you find them? Well, it's basic simple math here. Uh, F1x equals one multiplied by zero, plus minus one multiplied by U2x, which you now know, plus 0 multiplied by u3x, which you now know, plus 0 multiplied by 0. This is exactly what happens here and happens here for f4x. Notice, equilibrium check, uh, my teaching assistant messed up again, this should be 3000. That's a 0, so equilibrium. Also, if you calculate f2x and f3x using those equations, you will get 2000 
It should be 3,000, by the way. And zero. All right, so this ends the example for today, and we want to finish by talking about the displacement function. Now, this is high-level stuff, so, well, feel free to dive into that in the book of Daryl and Logan. Now, the displacement function that was chosen, I've just explained or just mentioned that the displacement function was going to be a linear function, and I said because the strain was constant, assumed to be constant, that's the simplest strain you can assume. If you assume a constant strain, which means, for example, a 5, let's say, or an A1, A2, sorry, then, well, if you want to find the displacement itself, you integrate that thing. And if you integrate A2, you will get A2x plus a constant, which I will call A1 now. So this is a linear equation. I assume the displacement function is a polynomial, but I have not assumed square. I only assumed the linear function for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Can you assume exotic stuff? Yes. You can assume cosine, sines, any cool stuff. Of course, who is the judge here? Which uh, displacement function is best? Well, the judge here is the accuracy between solving this numerically using finite element and solving this analytically by, you, by solving the big uh, ODE where you have EA and DU over DX equals zero. A lot of research has been done and we know that polynomials are the best here. So I have a bar, which means I have two nodes. Now I know MSC and BSC know that there are higher level bars and uh, all kinds of refinements you can do to that, but I will not be talking about this today. I'll be talking about this maybe later. But for us now, a bar has two nodes, which, and you should understand each node as being a point in 2D space. X is the location of the point, and Y is the displacement of that point. Now, if you have two points, it means that your displacement function can only be a linear function. U equals A1X plus A2, A1 plus A2X. Why can it only be linear? Because you only have the information of the displacement at two points. Let's say at x equals 0, you know what the displacement is. And at the end of the element, you know what the displacement is. That's the only two options you have after solving the finite element method. And that's the reason why a linear function works. If you have a parabola, you cannot know exactly the three elements with two points only. You need to have a third point, and that's why we call them higher order um, elements. For now, enjoy not knowing that, so we have this only. So two points means one linear function, which will be unique and ideal. The number of coefficients is basic number of nodes. Why? Because, I mean, here, yeah, because of this explanation. As a BSC level, you would say, okay, fine, uh, it's simple. If I have two points, then I need a linear function, three points, parabola, and so on. In MSC level, you're still understanding what a conforming compatible function is. And in PhD level, you know that this conforming compatible function should achieve both the compatibility in the real element as well as the isoparametric element and have a C power M continuity. It's kind of cool what we know, right? So basically that's my function, uh, u equals a1 plus a2x, which in matrix form looks kind of like this. So okay, um, let's go one step further and see what we will get with the steps. So now there is a big mathematical struggle that will happen here. What am I doing here? Now relax, I mean I know when you see huge equations would think, hey, what is happening here? The idea is that u equals a1 plus a2x, and we want to find the value of a1 and find the value of a2. How can you find them? Well, we know that the deflection at x equals 0, that's the start, because look, you have a bar element, right? You have a bar element between 1 and 2, and you know u1 here and u2 here, which means at x equals 0, the beginning of the bar, u is u1. Uh, which means if you put x as 0 here, you would have u1, because u equals u1, equals a1 plus a2 multiplied by x, which is 0, which gives you a1 equals u1. This is exactly what you see here. And then we apply the second point, which means at point number 2, my deflection is u2, which means that u2, deflection at point 2, equals a1, plus a2 multiplied by x. Now x at point number 2 is L, the full length of the bar. And we know that a1 equals u1, so u2 equals u1 plus a2 multiplied by length, which gives you an a2, which equals u2 minus u1 over L. And that's what you see here. With that being said, you can rewrite the displacement function 
using the two things you try to find in the finite element, which is u2 and u1. Further rewriting this into this code equation, where u equals u1 multiplied by 1 minus x over l, and u2 multiplied by x over l. And we can call this n1 and call this n2. And you will hear this a lot. This is called the interpolation function or the shape functions. The shape function is basically or the displacement field of any element is going to be the summation of the shape functions multiplied by the displacement at those nodes. Now, it is a strange word and is actually a little bit alienated to you right now, but with time, you will get, to, you will get the hang of it. I like to call them mixing functions. What does it mean? It means, well, look, you have a bar, right? And you know the displacement at 1 is u1, and the displacement at 2 is u2. If I ask you a question, can you tell me the displacement at x equals 0? You would think that's a dumb question, because at x equals 0, we are at node 1, and we all know that node 1 has the displacement of u1. And, well, if you take a look here, and say u equals n1, u1 plus n2, u2, when x equals 0, if you plug it into n1, you get a, if you plug this into n1, you get a full 1. And if you plug this into n2, you get a full 0. And I call them mixing functions because it kind of tells you how much influence u1 and u2 has on the displacement at a point x. So let's think about it. If I want to find the displacement when x equals 0, I believe that the full effect is going to be u1. I'm going to need 100% of u1 and 0% of u2. And this is exactly what happens here. n1 equals 1 in this case, and n2 equals 0. Continue this thought process. Let's say I want to find the u when x equals l at the length of the bar. Now, at the length of a bar, I am here. So I think that I need to mix 100% of u2 and 0% of u1. Well, let's take a look. What is n1 going to be at x equals l? At x equals l, n1 is going to be 0. n2 at x equals l is going to be 1, which means that you are mixing 1, and in the end you say 0, or n1, multiplied by u1, plus n2 multiplied by u2. And from the looks of it, you are mixing 0 u1 and full u2. Now here is a trivia question. What do you expect that happens if you want to find the displacement at the center of the bar? As it looks, I think I should mix 50% of u1 and 50% of u2. But is that the case? Well, let's take a look. So I want the deflection u or the movement u when x equals l over 2. Now this should equal n1 u1 plus n2 u2. Do you know that this is exactly how robot finds the displacement inside the bar and the forces inside the bar and the moments inside the bar? He finds the movements and the rotations from this cool mixing function and then multiplies by the stiffness. I do that in Strado too. We said x equals l over 2. So let's take a look at n1. When x equals l over 2, n1 is going to equal 1 minus l over 2 over l, which gives you 50%, or a half. And n2 is going to equal x over l, which is l over 2 over l, which gives you 0.5. So lo and behold, u actually equals half of u1 plus half of u2. That's the average. So I'm mixing half of u1 and half of u2. Now, of course, I will leave it for you. But I believe if you take a point close to 1, then your mixing is going to be high at 1 and small at 2, and vice versa. So those are my interpolation functions, or as I like to call them, mixing functions. The second guideline and the third guideline is the continuity. The idea of continuity is that, well, the element itself should have a continuous domain uh, of displacement. Why? Because the ordinal differential equation is going to thank you for having a continuous domain. That's why. It's much deeper, but I will leave it for now to this level. What about the continuity within the neighboring elements? Well, this is to stop something called the discontinuity. I mean, look, if 
The displacement element number 1 is here 10 and here 20, and the displacement here is 30. This means that you are no longer holding the compatibility because node 2 according to element number 2 should move 30, and according to element number 1 should move 20. You have this connection by 10, which doesn't make sense. So it doesn't work. Finally, it should allow rigid body movement, and I highly recommend you read this from the book Daryl and Logan. I will just try to summarize it here for you. Having rigid body movement means that if you stop those, you are generating stresses, which generates reaction and internal forces. If you allow rigid body movement, which means it moves as one piece, then applying boundary conditions will actually cause deformation that will cause internal forces. Uh, now, in BSc level, you would say, okay, fine. In MSc level, you would think, I see what you're doing. If you discretize the position into multiple small pieces, you can assume each one of them to be moving in a rigid body motion. So in PG level, of course, you would hate me and tell me you missed talking about the lower order versus higher order terms and how if you deal with rigid body movement, you cannot just simply cancel terms out of the equation. Cool stuff. And basically, that's everything I wanted to talk about today in this video. Also, a shout out to all our members and supporters, as you will see their names on the screen. Thank you very much. You actually support the channel in its growth and are a crucial part of its success. Thank you very much. I hope that you have enjoyed the video and it was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video.